Could it be that events in the history of the Shroud of Turin are still there for us to discover, decipher, and understand? If the essence of physical law is informational, then perhaps the image on the Shroud has given us not only a record of the resurrection, but a description of creation as well. Could it be that instead of science proving the Shroud is authentic, the image on the Shroud is proving the accuracy of the science? In the quest for scientific authenticity, has the miraculous meaning of the Shroud been rediscovered? What would it mean to the world if scientific research and the faith of generations could join hands in perfect harmony? Up to this point, the evidence seems to indicate that the 1988 carbon dating of a small piece of the shroud fabric was at best compromised and at worst completely useless. In addition to which, compelling corroborative evidence has been examined that places the shroud and the Sudarium of Oviedo on the same body. Ongoing research, meanwhile, has uncovered a number of other scientific anomalies that place the shroud squarely over the body of Jesus Christ at the time of his resurrection early in the first century, and at the same time, squarely at the center of a 21st century scientific paradigm that suggests a new understanding of our place in the universe and how it all began. We have also seen that scientists are now coming to grips with a whole new basis of physics, fundamental to the way nature works. In one of the most exciting discoveries to date, Dr. Petrus Soons points out that there is more, perhaps much more to this piece of fabric than meets the eye, even peering through a microscope. In 1931, Giuseppe Henri, a professional photographer was commissioned to make a photographic record of the shroud in connection with a royal event, which meant many photographs would be taken. Dr. Soons reasoned that if the negatives of these photos also contained three-dimensional information, a full hologram of the image might be possible. I contacted Dr. Alan Wenger and his wife Mary because I knew that he was in the possession of second and third generation copies of the negatives of the photographs that were made in 1931 by Dr. Henriet, a professional photographer. He made available these negatives uh, to me and uh, I brought them to Holland and in cooperation with the Dutch Holographic Laboratory, we digitalized them. And uh, if a professional looks at negatives, he can see how much information is in it. So we estimated that it would be about two to 300 megabyte. But it proved to be that most of the negatives had information up to one gigabyte, which means four times the information that uh, we estimated. There could be still hidden in uh, these uh, digitalized files a lot of information that we still don't know about. At first glance, we might think that negatives of photographs taken some 75 years ago would be less likely to yield usable data than modern photographs. But you have to remember that the techniques used back then required much longer exposure times and more light, which means there is very likely much more information on the 1931 Henri negatives than on any of the more modern photographs. Dr. Soons took the negatives to a holographic science laboratory in Amsterdam to see if they would be willing to test his theory. So when I came there with my uh, photographs and told them there was 3D information in it, they were very skeptical about it because normally you don't make a hologram of a photograph. Then they started uh, experimenting and they found out that they could make a hologram of this material. To correctly view these specially processed images of the holograms, please use your 3D glasses. It is very important uh, to notice also that uh, we didn't change any data. So all the information that is in the digitalized files is also in the holograms. What we did in the laboratory is we checked the whole shroud for existing 3D information. The only 3D information that we have found was in the image of the body. All the rest that, for example, Dr. Alan Wenger has discovered, for example, the flower images, that was a different imaging process. So basically you talk about three different imaging processing in the, the shroud. That is the blood, which was direct contact. The second was what uh, Dr. Alan Wenger has found, uh, for example, the flowers that could have been corona discharge, but it was a completely different process than the image formation of the body itself. 
It's important to realize that no other two-dimensional image in existence has been shown to contain three-dimensional holographic information. The whole body holograms gave us the possibility to see the image of the man on the shroud under angles that had never been seen before. We could confirm a couple of the findings, like for example the round little objects on top of the eyelids that have been interpreted as being coins. We cannot see inscriptions, but we can confirm that they are solid little objects. A point of controversy has always been the position of the legs, because you cannot see that very well on the photographs. On the hologram, of course, it shows extraordinarily well. The left leg was stretched, the foot was put in a diagonal position, fixed to the cross, and then the other foot, the right foot, was put straight in a vertical position on top of the other foot. That's why the, uh, the leg is bended. And there was used one nail to nail both feet and fix them to the cross. The hologram provided yet another surprise for Dr. Soons and his associates. One they are only now beginning to explain. The most exciting things that we found in uh, the hologram was uh, under the beard, in the neck. It was known already that it was a white line, but nobody could ever say what that exactly meant and what it was. It's a solid object. It is in the form like something like an amulet that was uh, put there. Now, after uh, studying it for quite a while, I could figure out that there were letters on it, on top, sticking out a little bit. Well, it turns out that that uh, information on that plaque is evident in some photographs and not in others. And the people at the Eindhoven Holographic Lab in the Holland found that slight variations in the focusing distance brought that information out. So on one photograph where we have this information, it was uh, just by pure luck that everything was right and they captured it. And what that, that is suggestive of is that there is inf different information at different depths into this image. And Dr. Peter Soons thought he saw letters there and he talked with a uh, rabbi and scholar uh, who was fluent in the Aramaic and Hebrew. And uh, the letters are apparent and, and they translated in those into a, uh, a meaningful phrase, which uh, says a lot about who this might be. Now these letters are ABA, Aleph, Bet, Aleph, which is the word Abba, which means father. Now seen the circumstances here and where the amulet is, that makes a lot of sense because Christ used to call himself also the son of God, the son of the father, the son of the holy one. So it is like saying, the amulet that was put probably by the apostles over there, like saying, here is the Son of God. This information is, is going to have to be checked out, but if it were confirmed, uh, this would just be along the line of several other things that have been written just recently, I mean literally hot off the press books, that are saying in early Christianity, two messages were preached from the very beginning. Jesus is divine and he was raised from the dead. Those two go, are right there at the beginning. They didn't come uh, decades later. And of course, that's the same proclamation that we find in the Gospels and in Paul. Could it be that it is possible after all to prove that this is not only an authentic first century cloth, but was in fact the burial shroud of Jesus Christ? But there was more. In fact, there was much more still to come. Tom DiMahala, while examining the hologram close up, asked Dr. Soons if a single fibril from the image area of the shroud was sufficient for determining whether the image contained holographic information. That is, if the shroud itself was a hologram. The answer had exciting implications. First, it's important to understand what a hologram is. Basically, a hologram is a pattern of interacting microscopic rings or interference fringes, not unlike the pattern created when a handful of pebbles are tossed into a pond. Every area of the hologram sees and stores information about the whole image. If you break a hologram into multiple pieces, you have multiple holograms, each bearing information about the whole image. And that is important for the Shroud of Turin also because the upper arms are missing because of a fire in 1532. So if, what I believe, there's holographic information in the Shroud, 
you would be able to activate that, you would see the whole body of the band and the shroud, including the missing upper arms. Testing is still being done to determine if, in fact, the shroud image does carry holographic information. Dr. Soons has already seen rings on the latest hologram of the shroud image, suggesting that this may be the case. Perhaps, in the not too distant future, we may be able to create a full, unblemished hologram from a very small area of the shroud's image. Indication of this can come from a single fibril. Having had a chance to examine the holograms, we asked both Dr. Alan Wanger and Tom DiMahola to tell us if there's anything there they hadn't seen before, to give us their impressions of the new data. The hologram does a remarkable job of uh, emphasizing the certain features uh, on the shroud. It gives a, an astonishing three-dimensional aspect to this. It makes uh, some of the features much more prominent, uh, particularly the scourge marks that we see uh,